presentation. And then thank you for the invitation, in particular, Professor Abi Plus. This is my uh, first visit to India and enjoying the conference so far very much. So today, um, I'd like to talk about uh, Gaiotto conjecture and then uh, its uh, recent fusion. So uh, Gaiotto conjecture um, is about certain brain, as uh, Laura has been uh, explaining to us in the uh, Higgin or Higgs moduli space. But the conjecture itself predicts something very surprising. Even it sounds like contradictory to what we have learned uh, from uh, Richard's talk about the non abelian Hodge and also allowed us a description of BAA brains. It's a very different uh, phenomenon happening. Then that's what I'm going to talk about, but uh, only in the end part. Since uh, this week it is a, a school part of the conference, so uh, instead of giving a conference type of talk, I'd like to give a school type of talk starting from a very naive question. So please uh, bear it, uh, with me uh, that I'm going to solve, uh, I mean, answer this question. So the question is, uh, how can we define a uh, second order differential equation a compact Riemann surface C of genus greater than or equal to 2 globally. So, of course, the uh, important part is this uh, globalness. And then um, when I am going to answer this question, what I'm uh, achieving is to give the simplest example of this uh, Gaiotto course about opus, and then that is indeed appearing in the uh, process of quantization of uh, Higgs bundle. So that's why I, I, I choose this uh, starting point as a question. So you say that uh, why such a question is uh, difficult? Because the second order differential equation, for example, you use a parameter u, d, u squared minus c, you may have a function here, and then you apply it to uh, a function, this is an equation. What's wrong with this uh, um, written here? But of course, this does not make any sense at all if you try to put it on a compact Riemann surface. I mean, genus zero, no problem, but the higher genus, what this should be, and what does this transform, transforms with respect to the uh, coordinate? That makes the situation difficult. So if uh, you uh, ask a question for the first order case, then uh, it is easy, the answer is easy, because instead of the differentiation, you use the exterior derivative, and then uh, you make, say, uh, um, omega applied to f equal to zero, where omega is, of course, one form say, holomorphic one form. There is no global holomorphic function, so I take, say, um, a meromorphic function. Then this equation is uh, globally defined. If omega is uh, given as, for example, a glo globally defined holomorphic one form, then uh, this is coordinate free, and it makes sense. Do we have that kind of situation here? And the answer is no. d squared is equal to zero, so you cannot use d. So what do you do? Well, um, uh, this um, gives us a hint that the probability is better to have something like a du squared applied everywhere, so that uh, you differentiate twice, apply du squared, you multiply something q of u, and then multiply uh, du squared. So q should uh, look like a um, quadratic differential. Then uh, what happens is that um, so um, suppose you do have a coordinate chain, so a change. So u is equal to u of z, z is another coordinate. And then uh, let's uh, look at uh, what it should uh, do. Obviously, d d u is uh, Jacobian d z d u, and then d d z. So uh, if you take a square, then this becomes a square, and then so, so this is equal to, of course, uh, one over u prime. So let's uh, use a simple notation. 
uh, du dz is just a u prime, and then the one over u prime d dz, and then the quantity squared. So there, uh, this one looks like one over u prime squared d dz squared. If that's the only situation, that is great. But uh, you have the cross term, so what uh, you, you have is plus one over u prime, and then d dz applied to um, one over u prime and then the dz. So this situation happens, right? And then uh, therefore, the things become a little bit um, uh, unpleasant. So um, uh, when you uh, finish the computation, um, uh, this one looks like one over u prime squared. So uh, d dz squared, and then uh, uh, you have this one you compute. Uh, why don't I just uh, skip my computation, I cannot probably do very well. So uh, what I want to say is that uh, this one will be minus half of u double prime, u prime, and then the squared. So uh, you just uh, complete the square by just uh, putting everything. Then uh, uh, I'd like to compensate by u double prime of u prime, prime minus one quarter u double prime, u prime squared. So uh, the original uh, did u square change in this form, and then you realize that, uh, so I completed the square, uh, maybe it's, it's not so easy to see this. This one is, so this part, maybe I just put the one half, and then uh, one half. So this quantity is called the Schwarzian derivative, so uh, dz of u, or in the notation, this is often written in this way. So, um, um, one thing we encounter is that uh, this simple differentiation, second order differentiation, has a, a function part which is proportional to the Schwarzian derivative. And then I'll just uh, uh, keep continuing the uh, computation. So uh, sh shifting with the um, uh, function can be absorbed by the gauge transformation. So this one is uh, one over u prime squared. And then uh, you have exponential, and then since this is a uh, minus, this is a half of log u prime, and then a d d um, z squared. Then um, you have this uh, um, plus half of Schwarzian derivative, and then um, you have this exponential negative half log u prime. So the uh, operator um, change into this one. Then uh, what I really don't like is uh, uh, this part. To um, eliminate what you don't want, what you can do is uh, choose a better coordinate. So um, the goal is, of course, to have something uh, coordinate independent, but uh, Differentiation requires a coordinate anyway. So we choose a good coordinate for a given complex structure of this uh, even surface C. So how do you choose a good coordinate? Um, so you have the Riemann surface. I want to introduce a coordinate system U alpha, U alpha comes with a local coordinate Z alpha. So you have this uh, patching U alpha, U beta. And then um, we take the uh, universal covering. Universal covering in this case is just a upper half plane. And then a curve is um, realized as the uh, universal covering by the group of deck transformations, which is isomorphic to the um, fundamental group of C. So when you do that, you have this uh, upper half plane here, the inverse image of U alpha maybe here. So the intersection would appear here. Maybe I should say U alpha inverse image, but maybe it's okay. Just let me be a little sloppy here. So you have this situation. Then you realize that uh, these two regions are actually uh, copies of the inverse image of this intersection. 
Therefore, from here to here is exactly the automorphism, namely Möbius transformation. So by using, appealing to the uniformization, you do have a, a coordinate system of the given complex structure where the transition function is only the SL2 uh, or PSL2 action. So this is A alpha beta, Z beta plus B alpha beta over C alpha beta, Z beta plus D alpha beta. So on um, every intersection, U alpha, U beta, you do have this a very simple um, fractional linear transformation as a coordinate change, and then this determines the original coordinate, um, original complex structure. And here, I'd like to impose a condition that uh, A alpha beta, B alpha beta, C alpha beta, D alpha beta is an element of SL2 real, which is, of course, analytic automorphism of the upper half plane. So every compact Riemann surface of genus greater than or equal to two has a, not unique, but a, this very simple coordinate system. And then what are we choosing in this way? So you can immediately compute that uh, from that expression, bz alpha, because of the SL2 condition, you just uh, differentiate. The denominator receives um, squared, and then the uh, numerator is simply dz beta. So uh, this coordinate uh, change implies this. Then uh, what does this uh, give us? Is the uh, choice of the half canonical or the choice of the theta characteristic automatically coming up? Uh, yeah, in February, I just uh, erased this uh, um, final outcome, but uh, I'll, I'll explain it again. So, C alpha beta D, Z beta, I'm sorry, Z beta plus D alpha beta. So let me just call this uh, C alpha beta to be equal to that. And then this is simply plus or minus square root of D Z beta over D Z alpha because of that formula. So uh, what I'm doing is uh, taking a square root of this ratio. And then, of course, this ratio, uh, using uh, Laura's uh, notation, this is a canonical sheaf, which is a sheaf of holomorphic one forms over the curve C. And then if I were to use uh, the uh, coordinate system I have just introduced, then this one corresponds to the uh, first cohomology uh, group element of uh, C alpha beta, namely square, uh, I'm sorry, uh, dz beta dz alpha on u alpha intersection u beta. So that is a transition function of the canonical sheaf. Therefore, taking a square root means I'm talking about the half canonical, which is uh, corresponding to uh, sigma alpha beta, but then the plus minus means what? So plus minus for alpha and beta simply means it's an element of H1 of the constant sheaf Z mod to Z, which is uh, simply equal to the um, uh, Z mod to Z to the power 2G, which is indeed two torsion point of the Jacobian of the curve C. Therefore, what you're doing is choosing the theta characteristic. So therefore, half canonical is a choice of a theta characteristic. And then uh, Michael Atiyah calls it a spin structure. So um, once and for all, let's choose a theta characteristic, and then which is the half canonical, so we choose it. Then the, by this choice, what you obtain is a um, local coordinate system where the transition function is a Möbius transformation. So the choice gives you the uh, Möbius coordinate system. Why this is good? Using that, the Schwarzian derivative is zero. So from here, 
uh, if you compute the uh, Sebastian differentiation of z alpha with respect to z beta, this is identically zero. So you have given the uh, globally defined second order differential equation, namely d d z alpha square minus q alpha z alpha, where this guy we have to determine what it should be, and then a d sorry d z alpha squared applied to uh, psi alpha um, z alpha equal to zero. So you change it. So this is equivalent to saying that the exponential, now I uh, erased here, it was like a, a one over, I'm sorry, half logarithm of u prime is over there. So this is now minus logarithm c alpha beta. So u prime was just a Jacobian. C alpha beta square is a Jacobian. And there was a, uh, one half before they cancel. So this is uh, the first thing here. And then dz beta squared, and then a ddz beta squared minus q beta z beta applied to uh, um, exponential. So this was uh, coming from the computation we have just done, logarithm c alpha beta, and then um, psi, so I have the same thing as a psi alpha, uh, z alpha, and then of course, this guy we would like to define as a z beta, z, uh, uh, psi beta of z beta. And then uh, uh, you realize that uh, since multiplication like this in the end does not make any uh, difference, so you do have a globally defined second order differential equation and then the one thing we learn, or one thing we learn here, is the following. So the important part is that the Schwarzian derivative doesn't show up in this particular choice of the uh, um, coordinate. For that coordinate system, I needed the choice of the half canonical. So half canonical plays a role. And then here, um, what uh, I'd like to say is that uh, if you compare these, then, of course, q alpha dz alpha square is equal to q beta dz beta square, which means that the q has to be the holomorphic quadratic differential, which is, of course, expected. Second thing is that the psi alpha is actually equal to, uh, so, of course, uh, e to the log simply means psi c alpha beta, but uh, this is inverse because I bring it to the other side, times c uh, psi beta, which means psi is not a global section, but it belongs to the inverse half canonical. So locally, psi is a section of the inverse half canonical. So this is what we learn. And then uh, um, what we needed is uh, one more thing. We need a um, um, uniformization Coordinate to make this uh, expression globally well defined. Okay, so that's uh, the observation. This is the metric of the constant as a curvature. Yes, you use a, a constant curvature metric, and then that singles out this one. So it's a uniformization theorem. And then that is also part of the Gaiato's conjecture, which uh, uh, I probably. automatically chosen to be the constant curvature metric. Right. Yes, so this, yeah, maybe that was your question. Yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, as long as the purpose is to kill the Schwarz and derivative, anything else would work, right? But uh, I particularly choose this one for the purpose of the next stage. Okay, so um, yes. So what uh, did we obtain? Of course, we did obtain a global. So it's a, a global second order operator. And then uh, I'd like to, uh, or maybe second order equation, I should say. 
And then uh, this is what uh, uh, the title says. This is an example of the quantum curve. So quantum curve means globally defined a higher order differential equation on the given uh, Riemann surface. That is what uh, it is all about. Now, what uh, we obtain, we'd like to check. What do we have? So, uh, C is uh, locally behaving like a section of the inverse half canonical. All right, then uh, why don't we consider its derivative? Derivative means uh, whatever the local coordinate you are using, you just differentiate. But then derivative would, of course, uh, give you one form tensored with this guy. So uh, derivative naturally lives on the half canonical, which is the inverse half canonical tensoring uh, canonical. This is one form, right? So the derivative uh, goes over there. So why don't we uh, try to find the equation for the following quantity, negative psi prime and then psi. It's a vector now. For this vector, you differentiate, say, uh, maybe alpha. So let's choose uh, local coordinate alpha. Now, obviously, this is equal to minus psi alpha double prime and then uh, psi alpha prime. Therefore, this is... Uh, um, then uh, a differential equation is that the second order differentiation of psi alpha is equal to Q of psi alpha, psi alpha prime. So this one is simply equal to minus uh, Q alpha minus one applied to the vector psi minus psi alpha prime and then psi alpha, which is the original uh, vector. So you realize that the um, you notice that we have realized a uh, Higgs field in this way. But the equation we got is a DDZ alpha uh, plus uh, Q alpha and then one, and then uh, multiplied to minus psi alpha prime, psi alpha is equal to zero. And then uh, to make it everything uh, consistent, I just multiply this is the alpha here. So this is the equation, which means you got a holomorphic connection. So let's uh, call this part nabla alpha, and then uh, uh, this part only. So uh, maybe I should say alpha one, and then this is alpha, so let me call this phi alpha of Q. So this is exactly the uh, Higgs field. And then, uh, since we know how does this transforms by uh, Laura's uh, ARIA lecture, let's let uh, E0 to be the vector bundle Kc half plus Kc mi uh, minus half, where uh, this vector lives in here, right? And then, so, so in this case, uh, phi is indeed the uh, global section of endomorphism. And then in this case, we don't have any trace of E0, tensoring Kc. So this is uh, uh, exactly what uh, it is, which means if we do use the um, uh, C alpha beta I defined before, so um, uh, C alpha beta was a transition function for the half canonical, so this is, uh, is a particular choice involved. And um, what uh, we have is that uh, um, C alpha beta, C alpha beta inverse multiplied to uh, phi alpha, uh, sorry, I should say phi alpha is equal to phi beta, then uh, it's inverse. So this is the uh, transformation rule of the um, um, Higgs field. That's the definition of this Higgs field. The problem here is that I'm talking about a connection. I'm not talking about this guy alone. I'm also not putting this differentiation. So this is a connection matrix. Connection matrix should not satisfy this condition, right? Connection matrix has to satisfy the gauge transmission. What is a gauge transmission? 
Are we talking about the contradiction? Well, the question, real question is, on which vector bundle does this connection live? That's the question. So let me just write. On which vector bundle does, so NABLA is a globally defined connection over the curve. So this is a correction of this guy. So this is DDZ alpha uh, plus phi alpha, DZ alpha, right? So on which vector bundle does this guy live? And then the answer is, of course, it is not equal to this E0, vector bundle E0. It is something else. And then what is it? So for this purpose, um, and then uh, for the really purpose of explaining the Gaiato conjecture, uh, I'd like to introduce the, sorry, following, um, yeah, um, um, maybe a computation should be suppressed now. So let me just uh, look at the following diagram. Zero goes to integer, goes to complex number, goes to C star, goes to zero. And then uh, integer goes to integer, goes to zero. And then the complex number goes to chief of holomorphic functions, goes to the, by differentiation, the canonical. And then uh, non-zero complex constant goes to uh, non-vanishing holomorphic functions. But if you take a D log, you get the same uh, canonical. And then uh, this is isomorphism. Let's look at this uh, uh, exact sequence. Yeah, this is what uh, Spencer Brock uses for defining a block regulator for the uh, second algebraic K group, which is responsible for the quantizability. And then that's why I'm recording this, because uh, um, I am talking about a particular condition we need for the quantization. Something is quantizable, only something happens. But anyway, uh, this is isomorphism, identity. Yes, identity, right. Like uh, this is identity, <laughs> right. Well, identity, uh, well, uh, isomorphism anyway. <laughs> so from here, uh, taking the long exact sequence, you have H1 C um, complex C star, and then going to H1, uh, C, O, C star. And then uh, remember, this is the isomorphism class of all line bundles. So the half canonical lives on here. And then it, this goes to H1 of C, K, C. But then uh, H1, C, K, C is uh, isomorphic to just uh, one line, complex line. And then uh, this one, so this is a D log homology version of the D log. D log gives you the H1, so this is a shift homology way of that writing, is D log C alpha beta. C alpha beta is a transition function, so you consider this an element of the shift cohomology. But then the question is, what is it? And then uh, chasing this uh, uh, exact sequences, long exact sequences coming out of here, you can actually check that uh, this belongs to, indeed, H2 of CZ. And therefore, this includes in here, which means this is just uh, G minus one. It's a degree of uh, half canonical. So what I'm talking about is that this quantity is non-zero. So this is a non-zero element in the uh, first cohomology class. And then I would like to choose the coordinate of C, a global coordinate called H bar, the Planck constant. So the Planck constant, which is the uh, deformation uh, parameter, deformation quantization parameter H bar, is indeed an element in here. But then I would like to uh, identify H1 C K C to be equal to the set of all H bar times D log C alpha beta. So this is the identification of the uh, Planck constant or deformation parameter as the shift cohomology group. And then uh, um, I'd like to introduce 
one more quantity, which is that the sigma alpha beta is equal to d c alpha beta d z beta. So d log means that the c alpha beta inverse, uh, and then you differentiate, which is sigma alpha beta. This is a definition, and then the d z beta. So what the sigma alpha beta does is uh, you feed inverse canonical. Multiply it, you spread out the can, uh, ha, I'm sorry, inverse half canonical I mentioned, I should have mentioned. You uh, input is inverse half canonical, output is half canonical. Therefore, this actually, so let me just uh, consider the class, this is an element of the extension of inverse half canonical to half canonical. But then, of course, this is isomorphic to, just I erased, this is a C, K, C, right? So, and then this uh, sigma alpha beta corresponds to this element in the uh, first uh, cohomology expression. So, class sigma alpha beta is non-zero. And uh, this being non-zero, what I try to do is to define, so define the uh, following object. Uh, maybe I just call it F alpha beta H bar to be equal to the two by two matrix, C alpha beta, C alpha beta inverse. And then I use this uh, um, extension element. So this is the uh, extension of the uh, inverse half canonical to the half canonical. And then, uh, First thing you check is that F alpha beta H bar is a whole cycle, which means F alpha beta, F beta gamma is equal to F alpha gamma. So uh, this definition doesn't uh, tell you if it is a whole cycle or not, but because of this definition, it is indeed a whole cycle. Therefore, um, the class of F alpha beta in the chief cohomology level, defines a unique vector bundle. So this is a rank two vector bundle. Now you have this uh, concrete transition function. You have a, a expression of the connection on each covering. You can prove that they satisfy the gauge transformation rule, namely, Nabla alpha is equal to F alpha beta H bar. Ah, I'm sorry, I, H, I didn't put H bar here. So um, eh, let me just define uh, first um, Nabla H bar to be just uh, D, D, Z alpha plus one over H bar uh, psi alpha Q, uh, phi alpha Q, and then uh, D, Z alpha. So let's uh, define the question to be like, like that. Then the conclusion is that the number alpha h bar is f alpha beta h bar times number beta uh, h bar f alpha beta h bar inverse. So this is exactly the gauge transformation property of the connection. Therefore, number h bar is a connection, holomorphic connection. on the vector bundle E H bar. So in other words, the pair E H bar and the Nabla H bar is a, um, I don't know, the element of the uh, drum uh, moduli space. So this is in the uh, drum moduli space for every H bar not zero. So H bar is a, um, if it is a, C star element, then this is indeed the element of the drum moduli. Okay. So uh, let me just summarize what we have just done. But uh, yeah, maybe before doing that, I have to mention exactly what uh, E sub H bar is as a vector bundle. So um, as you can see, if you put H bar is equal to zero, then uh, you are forcing this. Uh, 
extension element to be equal to zero, then this vector bundle is original E zero. So, first of all, so what uh, what is is E h bar? Well, E h bar is equal to E zero if h bar is equal to zero. That's obvious. That's a definition. But then, uh, what happens if h bar is not equal to zero? They are all holomorphically isomorphic to the vector bundle at h bar equal to one. Because extension class, you take a projectivization that gives you the uh, isomorphism class of vector bundles. So all h bars non-zero give you exactly one vector bundle. On this vector bundle, you have a one parameter family of uh, holomorphic connections, uh, nabla h bar. That's what uh, you have created. So, um, statement. And, uh, well, one more thing. By the construction, you have uh, extension. So, KC half, um, half canonical goes into EH bar, and then the quotient is, of course, inverse canonical. So, you do have this um, um, extension. That's the definition of the extension class. So this vector bundle is uh, obtained as an extension. These uh, things uh, put together, you have a theorem. No, I'm just uh, talking about the classical thing. It's known 50 years ago, so theorem. So you start with the, um, already this uh, terminology is, <laughs> I'm kind of, uh, So glad that uh, this stuff. Do I have to wear this by any reason, or can I just uh, forget about it? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, over there. Sorry. I just uh, don't know how to behave. <laughs> it's okay. No, no, uh, it's okay. So, Sarah, um, let E0 of phi Q be a. Uh, is it okay now? Okay. Be a point of the thin component of, um, say, uh, SL2 um, moduli, Higgs moduli. So this is uh, already you introduced. So this is just a point of the heating component. Uh, I mean, uh, which means just an uh, expression is uh, just a Q and the one. That's all what I'm talking about. And the E0 is this, uh, uh, Half canonical plus inverse half canonical direct sum. Um, and then uh, to do the following uh, here already, so the remark is that the half canonical is already chosen. So this choice is made. And then, then there exists a unique quantization. which is indeed the E h bar and the nabla h bar, where the uh, definitions are already gave, yeah, given, right? So, so E h bar is given over there, and then, so maybe just, I don't have to repeat here, E h bar is given by this uh, map, and then uh, nabla h bar is uh, given by this thing. So this is uh, um, given, and then uh, extension is given, so the language terminology is, that, uh, uh, so the uh, name. Um, if you take uh, h bar equal to one, this is what is called an SL2 OPA. So this is SL2 OPA. So from the uh, point of the hitching uh, component, you obtain an SL2 OPA and then this process is a unique quantization. Quantization could be non-unique. So, so here, quantization, uh, naively speaking, whenever you have a Z, um, yeah, uh, maybe, mm. uh, let me suppress that part. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, canonical quantization in two dimensions. So uh, the, the, the coordinate remains a coordinate. It's uh, conjugate, namely momentum, or the 
cotangent direction becomes a differential operator. That's what uh, we are talking about. Now, um, so if we define the h bar times uh, nabla h bar, so this is, uh, it looks like uh, h bar d d z alpha squared and then minus, uh, say, phi alpha of q. So this is a, a correction of this kind of thing. I'm stressing the differential part. So this is like a stationary Schrodinger equation. And then this is called, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what do I put where here? I put here. So this is called the Drain's uh, H bar connection. And then uh, this one, as an equation, if you make it uh, as an um, equation for the flat section, this one is indeed equivalent to the Schrodinger equation. This is uh, what we're talking about. And then uh, this is also globally defined. So it's uh, equivalent to the second order di differential equation. OK. So whose theorem is it? So you start with the point of the Hitchin component of the SL2 Higgs bundle. And then uh, you do have um, uniqueness of the quantization. And then the result is SL2 OPA. This theorem is due to Bob C. Gunning. He proved it in 16, 19, not 16, 1967. A paper was written in 65 or so, so it's uh, over 50 years ago. And then a paper appeared in Mathematicius Annalen. And then uh, it's been <laughs> not cited by Higgs community at all. So uh, it predates. Oh, you cited the sorry, you did. <laughs> Yeah, 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 right. And then, uh, yeah. So um, everything is done in this paper. It's so amazing. But of course, the language is totally different. So that's what uh, they, they, uh, he did. OK, then uh, uh, spending the rest of the time, I'd like to go to the uh, Guyotto conjecture. So this is uh, actually the example of uh, what the Guyotto's uh, conjecture tells us. And then uh, in the um, description, I would have to use the choice of the half canonical and then uh, uh, extension and so on, but that probably uh, would uh, become clear. So, Guy Otto conjecture. I do have to define Hitchin component in general, and that takes too much time. So, uh, let me just do complex group to be just the SL and C. And then, uh, 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 let me just give a definition later. And then, uh, the vector bundle E0 to be the uh, choice of the half canonical. And then uh, you just uh, do the following. And then there's a reason for doing this. So this is a definition of E0. And then uh, there's a, a particular choice of uh, phi of Q. And then, uh, uh, so this is the uh, Higgs field, where Q is, of course, element of the uh, Hitchin base. And then uh, in this particular case, it's uh, easy. It's a uh, uh, sum of items from 1 to n minus 1, h0, and then c, canonical, the power i plus 1. Uh, as uh, Laura has been uh, explaining, she used the a instead of b. So this is a uh, Hitchin base. And then a Higgs field, I have to define how you de uh, do it by using a pre No, 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 this is okay. It's completely symmetric, uh, degree zero. Right, and then, uh, 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 yeah, I'm listing these uh, exponents in a strategic way. So, as Richard uh, told us, 
if you have a solution, uh, if you have a, a Higgs field, you do define the uh, uh, what you call the twister line. So this gives you the following. Uh, well, may maybe I should say this uh, corresponds to the unitary connection, uh, differentiable phi, and then uh, a Hamitian metric that satisfies Hitchens equation. So, which means that uh, this uh, equation, the curvature plus the commutator of psi and psi dagger is equal to zero. And the second one is that the zero one part of the uh, 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 connection kills phi. So phi is a holomorphic one. But then from here, so Hitchens equation I don't write, uh, Richard has written. From here, you define what is called the twister line. So it's a one parameter family of uh, non-unitary connections. So this is a, um, a twister line. And uh, the condition is that the E is flat for all zeta inside the C star is equivalent to the uh, uh, Hitchens equations. So if you have a homomorphic Higgs pair, you have a solution to the Hitchin equations, and from there you have a one parameter family of uh, differentiable real flat connections, which is no longer unitary. And then from here, um, you do consider E tilde to be equal to the uh, D zeta is equal to one, zero, one, but, and then the uh, original vector bundle, um, yeah, just to suppress E0, sorry, just call it E, E, but uh, just a topological. So you have a topological uh, vector bundle, and then uh, you give this uh, zero one part of this flat connection, gives a holomorphic connection, I'm um, sorry, vector bundle, and then the connection is just a D, or the one itself on E tilde. So what you get is the, um, um, e tilde, nabra tilde, and then which, so this one is an uh, uh, moduli point, and then this one is, of course, a drum moduli point, and then uh, this correspondence is exactly what uh, Richard was uh, explaining. It's a non-abelian hodge. So non-abelian hodge can be described in this way. Okay, and then uh, we do know that the non-abelian hodge, which is Never holomorphic. This is just a differentiable map. Then Gaiotto's conjecture is the following. You do, a, yeah, so uh, from the mathematical point of view, it is uh, impossible to see another parameter necessary. So Gaiotto's paper is about uh, n equal to two super young Mills theory over four dimension, compactified on the circle of radius. R. So there's another parameter, R, and then uh, so zeta is a C star variable, R is a positive real number, and then you define 1 over zeta, but R times phi, plus a unitary connection uh, starting from uh, originally in the Hitchin equations, and then uh, zeta R phi dagger. You just define this. So it's purely real uh, differentiable object. Absolutely nothing involved in uh, holomorphicity. Then the conjecture says the following. Huh? Ah, uh, you use a star? Uh, it's a uh, Hamitian conjugate. Right. It's a Hamitian conjugate is usually dagger. <laughs> but uh, yeah, star is usually complex conjugate. No, sorry. Hamishan conjugate, okay? It's all right, Hamishan conjugate. Conjecture, limit, r goes to zero, zeta goes to zero, but you keep r, o, sorry, zeta over r, the ratio is fixed to be each bar inside the C star over D of zeta r exists. So this scaling limit exists. And is a holomorphic object. Then what is this holomorphic object? This is 
an SLN OPA, which is an SLNC OPA for every H bar is inside the C star. So that's a conjecture. What is surprising is that this is holomorphic. I'm not talking about the zero one part defining the complex structure or anything. So there is a complex vector bundle, holomorphic vector bundle, on which this limit of this real thing becomes a naturally a holomorphic uh, um, object. So uh, I do need to define. Uh, this is also flat. Flat. This is flat. No, I'm not introducing the holomorphic structure in that way. No. So this is not. Oh yeah. Why don't I just uh, write down the uh, definition? Um, Right. So, um, definition SLNC uh, OPA is a uh, pair vector bundle and then connection together with the following uh, three conditions. Oh. So, uh, Dagger depends on R. Metric depends on R. So this is a completely uh, non-trivial statement because if R goes to zero, the metric blows up. So you cannot simply say, just to take the ratio here, and then this looks like a zero square, so you suppress it, and this becomes holomorphic connection. No, that's not what, has, what is happening. The vector bundle is different. The vector bundle is different. Right. But that does not um, show that that guy has a limit. Right. Right. So uh, there is a filtration. So zero is equal to Fn, uh, goes into F minus one, goes, so it's a decreasing. And then uh, F zero is equal to the uh, vector bundle itself. Two. The connection sends fi to fi minus 1, that's add with uh, kc. So this uh, condition is called the Griffith transversality. And therefore, there is a variation of Hodge structure behind the scene. And then one more condition. Third, if you look at the NABLA, but then uh, apply to the, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, I, I plus one is uh, smaller, goes to Fi minus one, Fi, tensored with uh, Kc. So it's a uh, difference of connections. So a quotient means that you take a, a difference. And then, uh, therefore, this is an OC linear map. And then I impose that this is an isomorphism of OC linear line bundles. So it's an 
uh, isomorphism of, of bundles. When you have uh, these conditions uh, for the uh, element of the um, drum moduli space, we call it an OPA. And then uh, uh, one, two, three conditions um, is strong. And then uh, it cuts back the dimension to actually half. So uh, let's let uh, Higgs moduli, this goes by, uh, to the non abelian Hodge, to a, a drum moduli. And then here you have the holomorphic Lagrangian. So this is a holomorphic Lagrangian, which is a moduli of opas. And then here, um, still I haven't defined the hitching component, but the hitching component is again a holomorphic Lagrangian, which is a BAA brain, according to Laura's definition. What I'm talking about is that there is a, a way of constructing a, this guy from here. This is a quantization. It's a unique procedure, and then that is actually holomorphic uh, mapping from LH to LO. And then the point is, of course, this commutative diagram does not commute. I'm not talking about a non abelian Hodge. So it's a different thing. Yeah, so first I, I, I was uh, learning about the uh, BAA brain. So this is not, I mean, you go here, you do still have a B brain, okay? But I'm not identifying this and that by non abelian Hodge, therefore it's not a contradiction, okay? So there is a map from here. So what I'm talking about is probably, uh, uh, <laughs> for the sake of the time, let me just uh, uh, skip the detail of the definition of the a hitching component, uh, uh, many of you already know in general, but uh, um, uh, it takes too much time. Uh, because we have to use uh, um, principal SL2, which constant introduced to understand the topology of arbitrary complex semi-simple Lie group, it's a a Poincaré polynomial uh, has an exponent, and then the constant wanted to define this notion of exponent using a purely uh, representation theoretic way. He discovered it. That's a discovery of a unique uh, SL2 subalgebra in the the algebra of any semi-simple complex Lie group. And then we have to use that. And that's a, a source of the quantizability. But what I'm talking about is uh, let me just uh, phrase it in the kind of picture here. So this is the uh, uh, Higgs moduli space. And then since uh, I'm talking about the half dimension, I have to use just a, a line, but a line doesn't uh, give me enough space. So let me just uh, have this. So this is the uh, uh, hitching uh, section or hitching component, which is half dimension. And then on here, you have rays. And then um, what uh, I need to do, yeah, I do have to probably use uh, SL2. So uh, without the definition, let me say SL2 embeds into any complex simple Lie algebra. In our case, this is only SL and C. And then uh, so uh, SL2, so what I'm trying to say is that here you do choose uh, three particular Lie algebra elements satisfying that uh, x plus x minus commutator is equal to h, and then uh, a h x plus minus is equal to plus minus 2 x plus minus. I was actually planning to write down the explicit formula for h uh, and so on for the case of SLN, which I may do <laughs> after the hour. So this is... Uh, and then uh, what I'm talking about is that the C star action. And then here, I'm talking about the particular Higgs bundle where I just choose uh, X minus alone, it's a constant object, as a um, Higgs field. So this guy indeed sits above 
the zero. So this is a zero fiber. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the zero fiber hits hitching uh, component only one point. There's no here. So, so this one stick here and then goes out. So this is only one point in the intersection of the hitching component and the zero fiber. So this is a particular thing. And then this is the C star fixed point. So this is a variation of Hodge structure point according to Simpson's theorem. And then there's a C star action. So C star action doesn't reach here. When you make the C star action reach to the zero, it all converts to this point. Okay, so this is a picture you have. And then uh, on the other side, what you have is a drum moduli. And then you have the moduli of opas. And then there is a corresponding point here. Corresponding point has a name. So this is, uh, yeah, I even didn't define the vector bundle. I'm sorry. And then, uh, sorry, time's over. It says time's over. So uh, this is uh, called the uniformization. Opa. And then you do have a ray. And then uh, these rays are parameterized by h bar. And then how you get to this point? So, uh, so the point here looks like uh, e h bar and then nabra h bar. And then uh, h bar goes to infinity, gets here. So here, C star action, when you extend to zero, gets to this C star fixed point. Here, h bar goes to infinity, goes to this uh, uniformization, opa. And then each line corresponds to each line, line-wise, not point-wise. So uh, this C star actually acts on the inverse to h bar. But uh, this is a picture, and then the Gaiotto conjecture is solved. So final thing I have to do is to state the theorem. For any complex semi-simple Lie group, originality is conceived only for the SLN, but it is uh, uh, true for anything, and then that uh, work is done by many people. So Laura Fredrickson, you would uh, know already her, that you will be hearing her a lot from now. So she's a driving force of this paper, and then uh, um, Georgios Kidonakis, the Stanford uh, um, Anna Raf Mateo, and then uh, myself, and then uh, Andy Andy Naitsky, the physicist. So um, the uh, theorem is proved: limit exists, and then uh, the limit itself can be written in a very simple way. So I can actually give you the. Uh, um, Transition function, this is exponential of uh, h log xi alpha beta. Here, I do have to use xi, uh, xi alpha beta exponential h bar d log xi alpha beta x plus. And then uh, finally, of course, I have to give uh, um, nabra h bar, but uh, that is exactly differentiation plus the Higgs field alone. So again, Higgs field satisfies some transition function, uh, relation, but that becomes a gauge transmission when you change the vector bundle in this way. So this gives you the unique one-parameter family of vector bundles. Uh, thank you very much, and sorry for the overtime. I stop here. Yeah. And the OPA comes as a one parameter value. And the H bar is included in the They all live in the drum space. Oh, they, they do 
Google on the ground, yes. Yes, so, so we do have a, a social kind of thing, but which is just different from Different complex class on the system module, system module that uh, depends on your manifold. But then I use same the uh, uh, complex class, uh, complex class, uh, there is a P1 world complex class. But uh, as soon as you change from zero to somewhere, all complex classes are the same. So I'm just superimposing everything to the P1. Somewhere else, because that's an ingrained according to the 